As the weapons of war become more advanced, so does their capacity for destruction. Not just of military targets, but also of non-military infrastructure and the civilians that get caught in the middle of the war zone. This is where actions cross the line into war crimes. The concept of war crimes has been around for over a hundred years, and early definitions come from treaties like the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 and the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Our current definition of war crimes comes from the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The ICC prosecutes people of not just war crimes, but of other international crimes like aggression, crimes against humanity, and genocide. War crimes are explained in Article 8 of the Rome Statute. I'll go over a few of the highlights here, but I've linked the whole document in the description below and I encourage you to have a closer look on your own. One of the key war crimes is the purposeful targeting of civilians, as shown in Article 8b1. Now the key here is the intent to kill civilians and other people not taking direct part in the hostilities. As you can imagine, Proving that intent can be a very difficult thing to do, as the perpetrating military forces will find any number of excuses as to who they were actually targeting by targeting civilian infrastructure. And they might say that there were combatants hiding in those areas. Another related type of war crime is targeting hospitals and culturally significant buildings like those of historical significance or religious significance that are not of military importance. Too often in war, these historically or culturally significant structures are destroyed and lost to us forever, thus the justification of their inclusion as part of these war crimes. Also on the list of war crimes is using weaponry that would create large-scale collateral damage disproportionate to the military strategic objectives. This article explains that this large-scale damage isn't just related to loss of life, but also long-term damage to the environment. I can certainly think of the kind of weapon that this article was designed to address. The next war crime worth mentioning is the use of chemical and biological weapons. Perhaps the most well-known use of poison gas in warfare was during trench warfare in the First World War. But again, as technology of modern weaponry evolves, so does the destructive capacity of biological and chemical weapons. Finally, also considered a war crime is the use of child soldiers, and the Rome Statute specifically forbids the use of children under the age of 15 in war, and they should not be allowed to enlist in the militaries of their country. Right? And the list goes on. In total, there are 36 different actions that the Rome Statute specifically prohibits as war crimes under international law. And you might be thinking to yourself, don't these happen all the time? Unfortunately, yes, they do. And increasingly, belligerents use any means at their disposal in order to secure victory in their conflict, even if that means resorting to war crimes. Of course, there are also challenges here in proving war crimes happened, often. Perpetrators will excuse their actions by claiming that they're not targeting civilians, but that their opposing force is actually hiding their armed forces in these civilian areas, which means that there's a military necessity to their destruction. In effect, the perpetrators of these war crimes will claim things like their opposing military is using civilians as human shields. That said, even if soldiers are using buildings in civilian areas, does that justify leveling an entire city block or more just for those potential few soldiers that might be there? Another challenge of the International Criminal Court is that its jurisdiction is limited to the countries that have ratified the Rome Statute. So only actions taken in the territory of countries that are parties to the treaty can actually be tried by the International Criminal Court. And if we take a look at the map over here, well, you can probably see that there's a few countries that are not parties to the treaty that have done some pretty questionable things during wartime. Another issue is that often ICC trials are actually carried out in absence of the person who is being put on trial for war crimes. And the court often indicts perpetrators while they're still free. 
One example, and one of the early convictions of the ICC, is Joseph Kony, the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda and other neighboring states. You might remember him from the viral video from 2012. He was indicted by the International Criminal Court of 21 charges of war crimes and 12 charges of crimes against humanity, and is still a fugitive. To show just how difficult it can be to bring these perpetrators of war crimes to justice, one plot to catch Coney, and I kid you not with how surreal it is, involved using actors Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie as bait to draw Coney out by inviting him for dinner with the power couple where he would be arrested. And they were pretty much ready to go too. In an email to ICC Chief Investigator Luis Moreno Ocampo, Angelina Jolie wrote, Brad is being supportive, let's discuss logistics, much love, XXX. I had to double check to make sure that this isn't actually the plot of a movie, but I assure you it's real, crazy stuff. Of course, war crimes are serious, and innocent civilians who are caught in the wrong place at the wrong time should be protected and perpetrators that targeted them should be brought to justice. The International Criminal Court does attempt to do this work, but needs cooperation of the states involved to truly be able to carry it out. And if those accused are actually running the country in question, well, you can probably imagine how cooperative they're going to be. What it does allow for, however, are other forms of international action. For example, in the form of sanctions or increased military aid to those defending themselves from these perpetrators of criminal military actions. Another major question, especially in light of recent events in Ukraine, is how much responsibility the international community should bear from preventing these war crimes from happening, especially if it means potentially escalating the conflict. What's the ethical thing to do in this situation? It's a fine line, and different perspectives on ethics might have a different answer. One of the concepts that helps address this is the responsibility to protect. And you can check out my video on that right here. If you learned something today, give this video a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you again next time.